optimal labial line angles placed away from the contacts make teeth appear narrower due to the light reflection. In a case where space is restricted, the line angles placed near the contacts make the teeth appear wider. Proximal labial line angles the reflective light comes back, deflective light goes away. The larger the reflective area, the tooth appears to be larger. Smaller reflective area, the tooth appears smaller. Distal and mesial line and sizal line angles should turn inward. Here's an example of composite veneers that were done, and the operator did not pay close attention to how the line angles were placed. And you can see that the result is not very aesthetic. Now that it's redone and the line angles are placed properly and the curvatures are placed properly, and the laterals are made slightly shorter than the centrals, you can see there's a tremendous difference. And these are the kind of things that we need to pay attention to when we're doing diastema closures or composite veneers. The location of the contact areas varies from tooth to tooth. Between the centrals, it's located in one area between the central and lateral, it's a little bit higher. And between the lateral and the canine, it's higher yet. This gives a subtle smiley effect. If we get these reversed, then the teeth actually look like a frowny face. We need to pay attention to the shape of the embrasures on the incisal. Notice how it varies as we go distally it becomes broader. And these subtle little differences make tremendous difference in the outcome of what we're doing. This is the very first diastema closure that I did in my practice. And some of the advantages to using composite is that you don't need to use anesthesia. It's non-invasive. You're adding to the tooth. You're not taking anything away and they would be less expensive than porcelain veneers. So the question is, where should the labial proximal line angles be placed in this case? Well, obviously the teeth are going to be wider and we don't want them to look wide, so we'd probably want to leave the labial proximal line angles right where they are and then curve in lingually to the contact. And it's a little hard to see in this photograph. And I apologize for not having an incisal view, but it curved the surfaces that were added curve inward so the contact is in between the labial and lingual surface and not out on the labial surface. When I was in Mongolia training dentists, they had not seen this type of procedure done before. So this possibly is the first diastema closure done in Mongolia. And if you look at the left side, you can see that these teeth are fairly wide to begin with. So we would want to curve the contact back in lingually. Also, you might notice that the lateral incisor was lengthened slightly. and the incisal edge on tooth number nine was brought down to even things out. When I was in Madagascar, we uh, 
did some demonstrations on diastema closures and the dentists had not seen this before. And you can tell that they were very intently watching. Now this is a case that was treated orthodontically and instead of moving the teeth bodily together, they were tipped. And in the tipping, it created this dark triangle that can easily be corrected with direct composite, as you see in this picture. This next case, the teeth were moved bodily together, as they should be, but the, t the shape of the tooth created this dark triangle because the mesial surface normally is convex, but in this case, the mesial surface was concave, and so it created the dark triangle. And again, we can easily correct this with a little bit of composite placed properly. This is a case that was orthodontically treated, and the lower teeth all came together in approximately, but the upper teeth left openings. And this is because of a tooth size arch length discrepancy. Now, in order to treat something like this orthodontically, we would have to go to the mandibular teeth and strip them interproximally so they could be moved together so that when the upper teeth were moved together, everything would line up in the occlusion. So rather than do that, we can fix that with direct composites on the upper teeth and no further orthodontics is necessary. So looking at a case like this, what comes to your mind first? Do we do orthodontics or can we do it with direct composites? In this case, the patient was not able to afford the time or the expense of having orthodontics done and asked if it could be done with composites. Well, these are very large spaces. So what I'm going to do is show you a technique where you can take a photograph, blow it up on your computer screen, and then put tracing paper over it and trace the outline of the teeth that you're concerned about. And then you can really graphically see what kind of changes need to be made. So if we, with this case, my question is, how would you shape these teeth with direct composite restorations? Well, here's the drawing that was done. Well, I just explained. And now we can take a pencil and sketch in how we would change the shape of the tooth and then color it with the red pencil. So just study that for a moment and see what you think you'd like to do. Now, hopefully you came up with something like in this next slide. Notice on the incisal view that when these are built out, they aren't built out this way, but they curve back in, like we were talking about before. Then when the light hits the tooth, what's reflected back looks narrower than if we had that, coming, that line angle placed away from the contact. I'm sorry, closer to the contact. So in a case like this, we want to keep the line angles away from the contact. Here's a space that is not large enough for a bridge product <clears throat> that looks too small to be able to do a diastema closure. So this is how it was handled. And if you can very carefully shape those embrasures, you can get away with uh, a very conservative treatment. But the placement and the shape of those <clears throat> line angles is very critical. 
if you look at it from the incisal view, you can see how all four embrasures had to be sculpted just perfectly. So whenever we bring two teeth together, we do create embrasures, and there's usually four. We have an incisal, a gingival, a labial, and a lingual. And if we pay close attention to how we shape those, we can get a nice result like this. Recently, I received an email and a student, a D3 student, did this case, and then I, I wasn't involved, but he took a photograph on his iPhone and emailed it to me. You can see by carefully sculpting each of these mesial surfaces, you can get a nice result. This was a case done by one of the dentists that I was training in Mongolia, closing the diastomas on the mandibular anteriors and really got a very, very nice result. Uh, this space didn't quite get closed. The patient was very happy with it. The point of this slide is that there are things that we can do as dentists that make a big difference to our patients. Maybe not as dramatic as what I'm showing here with the problem with the ears, but um, some people, it makes a tremendous difference to them when we do some of these aesthetic procedures. So, most of us were taught to use an ink stamp template for a dental dam, and there are some disadvantages. And one of them is, is that if any bonding agent gets on our gloves and winds up picking up some of this ink, it winds up in the uh, composite. So I'm going to propose that we make a custom dental dam, and here's how it's done. We put the dam on the frame, position it the way we want it, stretch it out over the teeth that we're working on, and just put an ink dot in the center of each tooth on the incisal edge, and then we have a custom template. Then when we start punching the holes, the ink that we put on there disappears, so we have a nice clean dental dam to work with. On anterior teeth, I would recommend a number three hole punch for the centrals and the canines, and then go to a, a number two, which is smaller, for the laterals. You'll notice how the, the ink is disappearing. So number two for the laterals. And this is a, a heavy gauge rubber dam, which is what we want to use when we're doing diastomal closure, so it retracts the tissue. Then we lubricate the tissue side of the dental dam with the patient's saliva. If you're a dental student working on a type of knot, it's okay to use your own. Then we place the dental down. And if it's lubricated, it'll just slip right down in between the teeth. Then we need to floss in approximately and seat the dam completely. Let go of one end and pull the floss through rather than pulling up on it because that might pull the dam off. And 
then we want to stabilize the dam and you can use wedges for this or you can cut off a little corner of the rubber dam material, fold it over once, stretch it out, seat it on the distal of the canines and let go and then that way it will be stabilized. So in a case like this, you don't need to use rubber dam clamps. Now we need to invert into the gingival sulcus and we use the side of the explorer, not the, the point, and have your dental assistant dry in the teeth with air as you go so it doesn't slip back up. You can invert that right into the sulcus. We do that on the labial and on the lingual. So we don't have any leakage. Now we're doing it on the lingual, utilizing the mirror. So on the typodont, we don't have a diastema, so we're going to create one by using an 016 diamond, and we're going to create it between 8 and 9. So we're just going to make that space the width of that diamond on number 8 and number 9. If we had a, working on a patient, we had a diastem, we wouldn't have to do this because the space was already existing, but we're just creating one. Now, on the screen, the teeth are looking, are appearing upside down. And the reason for that is, is that we're working in a 12 o'clock position. And this is how it looks to us while we're working. Next step is to ensure that both of the teeth are going to wind up being the same width. So we take a bully gauge or some kind of a measuring device and find out what that dimension is. And in this case, it came out to 17. 17.5 millimeters for total width. So we divide that in half and that gives us 8.75 millimeter width for each tooth. And that's going to be our guide. Now, if we're working on a patient and they've been using fluor fluoride toothpaste, there's going to be a fluoride hardened enamel right on the surface. And we want to reduce that just a little bit so we can get a good edge. So I'm using a fine 021 diamond or 012 diamond and just cleaning it. We're not preparing the tooth, we're just brushing it with that diamond so that we have nice clean enamel to etch and to bond to. So don't think of it as a preparation, think of it more as a cleaning operation. And we can't go subgingively, of course, because then we would be catching the rubber dam and damaging it. So we can take a metal finishing strip and just slip it down there subgingively slightly and make sure that that enamel is nice and clean. These type of restorations usually fail or leak at the gingival margin because this hasn't been done and we don't get a good line. Now we're ready to etch. So we take a mylar strip and we're actually going to use this for two reasons. We're going to keep it 
the etchant off the adjacent tooth. And then we're going to use the strip as a vehicle to carry the etchant slightly subgingivally. So let's watch how that's done. So now we know that we have a complete etch everywhere where we're going to be behind. And we leave the etching on enamel for 20 seconds. And then we wash and dry. And we want to thoroughly wash it. We don't want to leave any etching on the tooth. Now we're going to place our bonding agent and we're going to use the mylar strip again for the same purpose. We don't want to get the bonding agent on the adjacent tooth. And we need to use that mylar strip as a vehicle to carry the bonding agent slightly subgingerly. So we get a, a really good bond. And then we need to air thin it for 10 seconds, and then we will wipe. For 20 seconds. And you see, up to this point, we've made sure that we're going to get a good, complete bond all the way out to the edges of our restoration. And it can also be cured from the lungo. Make sure that that's completely polymerized. Now we're ready to place our composite. And what we're going to do is take a small amount and just do the incisal third. So this will be the first increment. And we want to try to shape that as closely as we can to what the final restoration will be so we don't have to do a lot of finishing on it. We're going to spend a little bit more time on that smoothing, smoothing the margins with a glove finger with a little bit of uh, wetting resin on it. Start shaping the incisal embrasure. Easier to shape it when it's soft than it is when it's hard. Now we'll light cure that for 20 seconds. And once having done that, we've created a situation where Instead of a class four, we're dealing with a class three situation. So now we're going to place composite in the gingival two thirds. We can start from the labial and then push it through to the lingual. Now you wouldn't be able to do this if you had polymerized the incisal portion. And we're doing it freehand rather than using a matrix because we want to have a convex curved surface sealed at the margin. If we're using a mylar strip, it has a tendency to flatten out that proximal surface. Then we go to the lingual and while we're looking through the mirror where that excess is, we're going to Detail that and smooth it. And we've got plenty of time. This is light cure, not chemical cure. So we can get everything right the way we want it by freehanding. And then we're going to do a little bit of refining, some smoothing. We 
we don't want to have to do a lot of finishing on those margins. We want to get it just as close as we can. After doing the lingual, we'll come back to the labial just in case we change something and completely refine the anatomy and the margins. Then we can lock cure from the labial for 20 seconds and from the lingual for 20 seconds. And completely polymerize the Then we go back to our measuring device and check and see how we did. Well, got a little bit of excess here. So we're going to do some finishing here until we get just the right length so that both teeth will be the same. We can use a fine diamond. We can follow, follow that with a metal finishing strip. And then we can check it with dental floss to make sure that we do not have an overhang. It should go through smoothly and not fray the floss. In that case, it did fray a little bit, so we're going to go back and do some final smoothing so that surface is just ideal. Then we go back and measure. Now we're at 8.75 millimeters, which is exactly what we want. So we know that when we do the contralateral tooth, that it's going to be the same width. Before moving on to the next restoration, we have access to this. Let's go through the graded finishing strips and completely finish that down. In approximately and get it to a very high polish. We can do that with graded strips. Checking from the incisal to see if we've shaped those embrasures properly and put the line angles in the right place. Then we're going to take Teflon tape and the tooth that we've restored, we are going to protect with the tape. And just crimp it with your nail in the interproximal area. So if we build to that really thin Teflon tape, we will have a contact and we won't be uh, adhering to that previous restoration. So then we just go through the same procedure with our uh, etching, wash, dry, bonding agent, 20 second light cure, and then we're ready to place the incisal third of the restoration. And as we build this restoration, we're just going to make it the mirror image of the one we previously did. Form the incisal embrasure, the labial embrasure, and the lingual embrasure.
it's so much easier to do this when the composite's soft than to have to do it with a rotary instrument or a scalpel after it's been polymerized. Doing the lingual embrasure now. After, polymer excuse me, after polymerizing the incisal increment, then we place the gingival two-thirds, starting from the labial. Push it through to the lingual and create that nice convex shape that we want in the final restoration. We're not depending on a matrix to form this for us. We're doing it freehand. using your gloved finger for shaping and smoothing. And then your fine instrument for detailing. This is an interproximal carver, the instrument that you're seeing here. Uh, but it will work just fine using a half Hollenbeck. And then, of course, we have to go to the lingual and shape it and smooth it in detail. So that we wind up with all four embrasures, incisal, gingival, labial, lingual, shaped properly before we polymerize. Still shaping and smoothing. And then we cure it 20 seconds from the labial. And 20 seconds from the lingual. We no longer need the Teflon tape, so we remove it. And that tape is so thin that it just leaves us a nice contact and prevents the composite from bonding to the previously placed restoration. You can see that we do have some finishing to do here. And the best way to do that is to use a number 12 scalpel. We're just removing that small amount of flash. And at this point, we'll take the dental floss and see if we have a contact. Looks like we do. Then we can use our gapped strips. But the contact is there, and it's nice and smooth. So all the finishing that we're doing is around the contact and not through it. We try to avoid the contact with the abrasives. Then we can go to the graded strips and go to the medium and the fine and get a very high shine and smooth finish everywhere.
But when the, okay, this is the finest, so you can go through the contact with that. We'll go back and check out with the floss now and see if everything is smooth. Make sure it doesn't fray. Now we can remove the, the dam. And the safest way to do this is to pull it out and cut the septums like this so that you make sure you're not going to be cutting a lip. Just pull the rubber away. Then we want to check the occlusion. And we can use a football finishing instrument to do that on the lingual. Because that lingual surface is concave, so we want to use a convex instrument. On the labial, if we have to do some finishing, we can use a very fine diamond or 12-bladed carbide. And being careful not to flatten it out, but to maintain those convexities that we created. Then we can go to the graded discs and go through the medium, fine, and super fine, and gradually bring that restoration to a very high polish. I would not advocate using a coarse disc because it's too aggressive. Start with a medium. Same thing on the lingual. Medium, fine, and super fine. And then we can use polishing paste on the finest disc or you can use a polishing brush and then bring the restoration to a very high luster. This is diamond paste. So here are our completed restorations. This is not what we want our restorations to look like. We want to follow the principles of good dental anatomy. And we want the contacts to be located in the right area. So notice how we're right on the line here. As we go posteriorly, it goes up a little bit higher. We want to look through the mirror and make sure that that contact is located about in the middle of the contact area and not out on the labial surface or the lingual. This is a previously placed class four restoration.